little right, it's like the attendees is kind of rolling in. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is CJ Idle. I'm the executive director here at the Museum and Archives of Rockingham County. And we are here tonight joined by Lindsay Abbott, our lead researcher on the Great Blue Power Project, Dr. Debbie Russell, uh, Mark Board member, and uh, also one of our researchers, and Dr. Sarah Susan, if I pronounced that right, uh, Sarah, she is our um, keynote speaker tonight. Um, just to give you guys a heads up how it's going to work, we have 10 high school interns who have been working on this rural history project with us for the past couple months. They are monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions throughout the program, pop them into the chat with the Q&A. The interns will answer that. If they don't answer it, you'll circle back around at the end of the program to um, answer those questions. So as you have questions, just go ahead and send them to us and we will select those to share. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Valencia and let her uh, talk to you more about Great Allegiance Palace. Good evening, everyone. My name is Valencia Abbott, and I am excited to be here for the third year, the 52nd anniversary of Griggs versus Duke Power uh, Company uh, Supreme Court case. Um, this year, our focus is on rural education. And um, what I am attempting to do, okay, uh, so uh, is to get to my first screen. Again, I am really excited to be here. Um, I am going to start with uh, background information, uh, hopefully to catch everybody up that uh, regarding the grid versus Duke Power, and then to explain why um, this focus is on rural education uh, in Rockingham County uh, during this time period. One moment. All right. So Griggs versus Duke Power. Um, this case actually will begin in 1966. Uh, when 14 men will sign their name to a note and place that note on their supervisor's desk. Um, these 14 men was um, Eddie Broadnax, Eddie Galloway, Clarence Purcell, John Hatchett, Junior Blackstock, Willie Boyd, Lewis Hairston Jr., Robert Jr., Clarence Jackson, William Purcell, Herman Martin, James Tucker, and Willie Griggs. Every time that I've given this presentation, I like to acknowledge them by calling out their name individually, because individually it took all of them to sign that. It took bravery for them individually. But together, together they are going to form a powerful force that's going to take them all the way to the Supreme Court. So in 1966, these men worked in the Labor Department at um, the Duke Power Steam Plant, which was located in Eaton. The note basically said that they wanted the opportunity to apply for other jobs throughout the plant. And from 1966 to 1971, there are gonna be hurdles um, that's going to be put up in their way that's not going to allow that to happen. And until March 8, 1971, when a unanimous decision is going to come down, that's going to alleviate that. Now, that doesn't mean that your fingers was popped and everything was uh, kumbaya. Um, but it is going to set in, emotion, in motion what is gonna be the ending of this contemporary version of the civil rights movement. And a lot of this has to do with this case. Now, why the focus on education? With reading and researching this case, one of the things that I come to find out is that that educational element had a really 
big factor in how this case was going to be decided. One of the hurdles is that it is said that the men did not have the right education. They didn't have the right ability or the skill level to apply for other jobs. And as I kept mulling that over and over again, I thought I really need to take a deep dive into this aspect of this case with education. Ooh. I am so sorry. So how did we get here? In um, last year, in 2022, I had the opportunity um, to work with the National Council for History Education um, and received a grant on their project with the Rural Experience. And with that, I was able to create a program that provided an internship for 10 students in Rockingham County. It happened to be that I got the most 10 wonderful students ever because they all come from Rockingham Early College High School is where I teach. And they all, all are members of my history club. So these 10 students over the last six months or so have been working really, really hard uh, to come up with all histories so that we could take a deeper dive, a look into what this time period is going to do um, in regards to the plaintiff. And the reason that I chose 1920 to 1970, because this is when these plaintiffs would have come of age. And I wanted to know what did their existence look like and how did their edu education impact this ruling? So as uh, CJ Idol has, who's the executive director of the MARC has already said, um, those interns are on the um, call now. They will be monitoring the chat the chat. They have done interviews with people all over the county. So as we go through this, you may have particular questions for them um, in regards to the school. I think we have a really great sampling of different schools. And as CJ has said in a previous meeting, they now are like the leading expert in all history in Rockingham County. So I am really, really happy um, that that is tied to my students because they have been really wonderful um, with that. So before I move to my last slide, which I'm going to click on, um, I want to go back and acknowledge the plaintiffs and their families. So if any of the plaintiff's families are on this um, Zoom meeting, if you would put in the chat um, who you are and which plaintiff you are related to, I really want to acknowledge that because these 14 men, what they did is beyond brave. Um, they did it two years before the assassination of Martin Luther King. They did it when they didn't know if they was going to have a job that next day or even that next moment. They signed their names when they knew that it could have meant their death. It could have meant harassment for their families, loss in employment for their families, but they still signed their names. So again, if you're any member, um, if you're kin to any members of the uh, plaintiffs, please acknowledge that. Also, I want to acknowledge a uh, special guest. I didn't see all of the, um, the attendees, but I did see one uh, in particular, and I just want to give her a shout out, and that's Dr. Brooksy Sturvant. Um, and I'm gonna call her Brooksy, so I'm not gonna be formal here, uh, but I did see that um, she was uh, on the call. Um, Brooksy has been working um, with me probably over a year. Uh, she is an author and she is in the progress of writing a children's book about this case. And she will also be um, doing the readings 
when we get to the civil rights trail marker and the uh, state historical marker, which I'll speak to in a minute. And I also want to uh, take this time to acknowledge um, the past participants for this program. Um, Dr. Cynthia Tompkins, who was the um, keynote speaker on our first one, who gave us the legal background on the case. And Ms. Elaine Jones, who talked about the silent generation, who filled in that cultural gap of what these men um, were doing. So all of this gets us to this point where we're going to look at um, rural education. So before I turn it over to Dr. Debbie Russell, uh, I just want to make two points. Um, one, I've been researching, actively researching this case since 2018. And I just want to share uh, some exciting news. Many of you probably are on this call already know, but many of you may not. Um, this case, this project um, has been granted two historical markers. One um, is the North Carolina Civil Rights Trail marker, uh, which is um, from the North Carolina Her uh, African American Heritage Commission. And then the second one is the North Carolina State Historical Marker. Uh, so please be look out for information regarding those dedication ceremonies. Um, those will be coming up sometime this year. And just as a, a, uh, a point, this program will continue next year. Uh, when I initially started, I said, I'm gonna do the 50th anniversary and this is gonna be it, but obviously this has not left me. So um, the next year's focus for the Griggs case, I will be looking at World War II veterans. Eight of the 14 men were World War II veterans. So that is going to be my focus for next year, All right? So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Russell. The slideshow mm -hmm. from beginning, I believe so. All right. Well, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to try to give some background on what schools were like in Rockingham County. And to do that about the middle of the 20th century, I think we need to back up and see how the schools developed over time. And as a part of the Rural Education Project, we did start with the question of what schooling opportunities were um, available to the plaintiffs in this case. And you'll see 1820 there. And the reason I, um, that seems like a long time to go back, but that's the first recorded uh, um, information we have about schools in the county. There were at least two private academies uh, in operation in 1820s, one in Leakesville and one in Madison. And these would have been um, some educational, formal education for a few young men in the county. As Valencia mentioned, Rockingham County opened what was likely the first public school in North Carolina. And I say this because we, we do have documentation that the first free school, as you see on this highway historical marker, opened. It was in the southeast corner of Rockingham County in January of 1840. And our documentation for this is from two different newspapers. Um, in, February of 1840, an announcement appeared in the North Carolina Standard, a Raleigh newspaper. In it, it talks about the opening of this school. It talks about the county being surveyed into districts and schoolhouses being created. And it names several men who were responsible for this and gives them credit. So this is our historical evidence that Rockingham County had the first public school in North Carolina. In 1848, we have some other local documentation that um, these schools were operating in a very uh, healthy manner. There were several, um, you, 
probably can't read this now, but anybody who wants to look at some of this information later, you can watch this program on our museum YouTube channel and stop it and look at some of these um, bits of evidence that I have. But these were formed under the um, 19, 1839 um, Common Schools Act. We have this is a photocopy of a report. It's at the Rockingham Community College Historical Collection. And in it, you'll see that there were 34 districts reporting in 1848, a total enrollment of 1,690 students were enrolled in these schools in Rockingham County in 1848 evidence that they, these um, schools were growing across the county. And I was mentioning there were 995 males and 695 females enrolled in schools in Rockingham County in 1848. Of course, the Civil War disrupted life everywhere. So we'll jump to after the Civil War and after the passage of the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed citizenship and equal protection under the law. North Carolina wrote, delegates wrote a new constitution for the state of North Carolina. These were reformers, black and white, who came together to write this very progressive constitution. Article nine reads this way, a general that the legislature should provide a general and uniform system of public schools, wherein tuition shall be free of charge to all of the children of the state. This meant everybody. Ages six to 20 was what they considered school age. Very few people had an education. Lots of people needed schools. This is a document from the school board minutes. And in 1877, we see a real effort. The people in Rockingham County took that as a mandate to organize the county by district and to, or, um, to get schools as widely spread across the county as they could. So the county was divided into 36 districts. They wrote a letter, and this is the way they were divided. This is sort of like a deed. It reads like deeds, where all these districts are located. You might wonder why schools are where they are. This helps explain some of it. They were uh, located in places at the time in 1877 where there were uh, enough population where there was enough population across 36 districts. And they're described this way. This, for instance, District 13 says, bounded as follows, starting on the north bank of Dan River at the Stokes line, north with that line to the north of James Air store to a persimmon tree, thence east. And you can see some of the descriptions would have been very ambiguous, especially to later generations trying to figure out where their school district was and who was responsible for that. The committee men were three of them were um, assigned to each um, district. They had to decide how many students were available. They did a census of potential students ages six to 20. They had to obtain or build a structure that could be used as a schoolhouse in each district, one for each race. Then they had to oversee and maintain these schools. And sometimes that was for years on end. Um, so if you had a very eager group of committee men, you had a, a good school or an adequate school, and if you did not, then no school was provided. But they, um, the board called in these committee men, and there were over 100 of them with 36 districts. Um, and if they weren't trying to uh, build a school or get one, they were reprimanded and, and told to get busy doing that. Um, so what happened is lots of schools were built. This is an uh, example. This is on the grounds of Rockingham Community College. It is from 1882. We believe it was built then. It was Grassy Springs School. It was in the Mayo Township on Whetstone Creek Road originally, and it's been moved to the campus there at RCC. And it has been renovated, of course. The dozens of school houses like this one operated in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And if you went to school in Rockingham County, of any race, students of both races, probably went to a school something like this. By 1898, there were 70 such schools that look similar to that in this county, 70. Uh, 
Um, oh, I'm sorry, more than that, 70 for whites in the county. 20 of them were long, like the one you just saw, 47 were wooden frame. There were 40 similar schools for African-Americans. So more than 100 schools like this were built by 1898 or found in homes. Some of them took place in the homes of um, teachers, uh, maybe in a church in the community. The term was about four months in 1898. Some of these early schools, I'll just show you pictures of a few. This is Joyce School. It was built about 1914. It was on Ledbetter Road off Ayersville Road in the western part of the county. This is Glenn Schoolhouse from about 1920. It was near present day Eden. So dozens of these schools existed. And this is where everybody went to school basically up until about 1920. Here's Reed Schoolhouse. Also, some of them you might notice that some of the roads in Rockingham County are named for where these schoolhouses were located. Not all of them are, are standing these days, but um, you have Case School Road and Happy Home School Road as well. Debbie, is mm -hmm. this school still standing? I think this is a recent picture of what is believed to be Reed Schoolhouse originally. It looks like someone lives in it now, but I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, at the same time, you had more than 100 of these kinds of schools across the, the county. You also had some private schools, especially um, located in the towns as they grew. This is a picture of Reedsville Seminary. Lots of times these private schools were called seminaries. Today, we think of that as a religious institution, but then it was just more or less a school and training some new teachers. Sometimes it was called seminary. This one was very um, successful and over a couple of decades was in existence. There was one in um, the Eden area, Leakesville Spray Institute in the early years of the 1900s. And then Sharp Institute uh, was over what's called intelligence community, <laughs> which is an apt uh, name for a place where a school was located. I have a link right here at the bottom of my um, frame that is a link to an article on the museum website that you can read about the Sharp Institute. Um, district committees everywhere were still responsible. Those same, sometimes it was still three people in a community responsible for making sure the area had a school. So there, it was a really decentralized system of uh, operating schools. Um, some, you might notice that this is Bethany School, District Number Six in 1914, which is quite a nice school. And uh, it's quite a bit larger than the log cabin you saw a minute ago. And this is because Bethany had uh, decided they were, they voted to have a special tax district uh, and so they had money that they taxed the local people and used for their schools. And eventually Bethany had a later grades, maybe not all the way through high school, but upper school there as well. Um, in the towns, they really, uh, population really grew in Reedsville and Leakesville areas, Spray. Up in that area, at least from Spray, because of the textile mills and they had all kinds of workers moving in and their children all needed to go to school. In Reedsville, it also grew very, very um, fast. They had a lot of jobs in the tobacco industry. At one time, uh, Reedsville was larger than nearby Greensboro. <laughs> so that might tell you um, how, how much they needed. This is quite a school from 1910. This is the Franklin Street School in Reedsville in 1910. That looks quickly a lot different from the rural schools, which were still very much one and two rooms overall. District committees, as I mentioned, were, were um, still responsible up through 1914. This looks like a really dark picture, but I got it from a special issue, and I'll mention that to you. There is one if you're really interested in schools in Rockingham County. October 16th, 1914 issue of the Reed School Review, and it's online. You can get it through your public library on NC Live, and you can see the whole issue and lots of other issues from Reed School Review and other newspapers. And it has a picture of most schools in the county in 1914. So we really get a quite a view, a dip down into our county's history right there. In the 1920s, you had a period of consolidation. 
And these are two uh, pictures of schools that were built in the 1920s. The top one is Wentworth School, which was built in 1923. And it's still here and standing. At the time, it was just an amazing building. Handsome, beautiful. People were more, more, always remarked at the beauty of the building. Um, and it was a rural school, really. There wasn't um, much urban area around it. Uh, and then the bottom one is the Leeks Full School okay. in the twenties. Can I get some clarification? Mm -hmm. When we talk about consolidation in the nineteen twenties, we're not mm -hmm. talking about black and white students together. You're talking about consolidating those smaller one house room schoolhouses into bigger schools. Right. And yeah, because only, I think that mm -hmm. would be kind of confusing when when you hear that word consolidation. Yes. You think, but yes, okay. that's that's what it is, and it's almost all it. It's white um, schools consolidating at this point. In the teens, 19 teens and 1920s, there was a um, period in which Rosenwald schools were built in the county and we had 10. And I'm going to leave some of this for Dr. Chuson. I hope you will fill in some of the gaps. And I'm just going to mention uh, the Rosenwald Fund provided part of the money. Then the local black citizens would contribute money sometimes the land, they would work certain hours, grading the property or getting it ready. They held fundraisers to help raise money to build it. And then the rest of the money, and it was the largest portion, came from public school funds. And here are seven that we have pictures of, and I will credit, I put my credit there. These are from the Fisk University database. Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And the top one is Elm Grove School, which was south of Reedsville off of 87. Sadler School out in the Ruffin area, I think. Uh, Wentworth, this is where African Americans would have attended while the white students went to that beautiful uh, brick building that we saw earlier. In Madison, you have this, the top picture is of the school in 1920s when it was first built. It was built in 1924. It was called Madison Colored School all the way up to 1950 uh, when another more modern facility was built. At the bottom, you see a picture of it today. It's the only one of the Rosenwald schools in the county that is still standing. And the bottom three, we have Hayes Chapel, which was out um, Near, near Intelligence and the Commerce Chapel area, Garrett Grove School, and then Stoneville School is a little bit larger. I didn't mention that the Madison School was a six teacher school. The Stoneville School had four teachers. And the thing about the Rosenwald School, as you can see, these are better than those log and those wooden um, pictures that we saw earlier. They have large windows. They were meant to be um, providing good um, sunshine coming through. It was for the physical health and the safety of the students and to provide a better schooling situation for them. Most of the time it was on um, well-drained land and property. They made sure that they were placed properly. Um, and this is a picture of 1920 schools uh, taking the bus, <laughs> such as it was, to the Wentworth School in 1920. And this, uh, this uh, mass transportation uh, on a small scale, I guess, to schools was provided for, uh, with public money starting in the 1920s. But for African Americans, uh, they still had quite a while to wait before any type of public transportation was, was provided for them. If students lived far from the schools that were available to them, then this was a real issue, getting to and from school. Um, during the 1930s and 40s, by then four school systems uh, existed in the county. They were segregated by race. And this map shows in the, the yellow areas or, or the towns that developed. And each of them had their own school system. And what happened there is the, the people in the towns built their schools. They hired their own superintendents hired their teachers, had budgets, uh, and pretty much ran their schools there. Everything else that you see outside of those areas was in the county system, the rural system. 
Um, so from corner to corner, they're all spread out all over the, the county. Uh, I want to point out up in the corner, Goinstown in the northwest corner before I move to the next one. One thing that made the schools in Rockingham County a bit different from other counties was that we also had an Indian school. We had four school systems that were sort of regional. They were all divided into two more in a way because each one was divided by race. Then uh, we had one school that was designated an Indian school in Goinstown. This shows a bookmobile from the library visiting them in 1949-1950 school year. The enrollment that year was 41, and these would have all come from that community in the northwest part of the county. This, a narrative, a historical narrative of the Goins School is very, very interesting and would take about an hour for us to cover part would, of that. So. Would Black students have attended Goins School? No, they were, um, they were completely separate from Blacks and Whites. So for almost all of the history that I've seen, they're listed as non-white in those lists. But as it gets closer to the 50s, they, they get moved over into the white column. And what happened here is uh, this, this was a one teacher school and um, they had very limited facilities, even into the 1950s. They, you know, they were operating as this rural one teacher school. And in um, 1955, these stu the students who had been attending going school, it was closed and they, went to the Stoneville School from that time forward. Only Robinson County in North Carolina had more uh, different districts and schools. Than in the middle of the 20th century, and I will try to hurry because I know I'm taking Dr. Tucson's time, there were three high schools that were available to um, African-American students. One was Douglas High School in Leakesville, and this is a picture of, it's today's picture, but it's what it, uh, the main part of it would have looked like. And it was named for Frederick Douglas, so it is correctly spelled with two S's, but very often in the record, you see it with one. I've already talked about Madison College School in, in, in Madison. It was a Rosenwald school, and it um, started in 1920s, it was open until 1950, and in the late 30s, it had high school level classes. The third one that was available for African Americans was Booker T. Washington High School, and this is a marker that was placed by the city, I believe. This was um, located, it was a two-story frame building um, that provided classrooms for African Americans in Reesville and beyond, many, many African-American students in the area went to Booker T. Washington because it started in 1922 and it really did have some well-known uh, leaders. Dr. S.E. Duncan is listed. He was a state leader in African-American education. Um, and this was where African-Americans went in the Reesville area until 1951 when a new school was built. White um, students had high schools in Reedsville, Ruffin, Wentworth, Bethany, Stoneville, Maidan, Madison, Leakesville, and Draper. And this is a picture of the Bethany School that you see in the mid 20th century. And Black students had two? Three. two three, three. Madison Color School, Douglas, and Booker T. Washington. Okay. Now, these are way too involved, but you can go back and look at them later. But this, this is how the four systems were divided Madison, you had a system called Leakesville Township. Um, they still had a couple of small schools for African-Americans in the high school. And this is what Reesville had. But I did want to show you this one. This is <laughs> what happened out in the country. Uh, Rockingham had all those on the left that, um, I'm not sure how you're looking at it, the left, I guess, um, the white schools. And Goins was listed there in the documents that I saw with those. And on the right, you see 21 schools. And I think that was pronounced Benaja. Benaja. Um, uh, and Benaja. these are different areas of the county, all over the county. And these were one and two room um, frame wooden schools 
that were still in use in 1950 for African Americans. So we had four separate school systems and 57 schools, 21 of which were these one room schools in the county system. And then the very next year, three schools were built for African Americans, grades one through eight. They were Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Stone. Stone was in Stoneville. Roosevelt was south of Greensville and Lincoln was in the Ruffin area. So these went to up to grade eight, grade eight. And then after that, African-Americans would still need to get to one of those three high schools that I named earlier. Now you have four separate systems and 36 schools, so which is much more manageable, I think. But what happened with those small schools is they were all sold in 1950 the, for the land primarily. These are not good pictures, but the schools were much more uh, attractive than, than these two sh schools show these pictures. In a period that's sometimes called equalization in 1950, there was a flurry of school building there. The state um, appropriated money for new schools. In the Madison area, we have Charles R. Drew School. It was opened in 1950. And Booker T. Washington got a new school over on Moss Street in 1951. And um, you had a relatively new school in uh, Leakes Already at Douglas. They'd had a fire in the late 30s, so they had a, a newer school than some. Um, the, just to quickly mention, Charles R. Drew was named for Dr. Drew, um, who was a noted physician and blood specialist. And he was killed in a car accident in nearby Alamance County earlier that year. And so I, I'm thinking that that may be the first school in anywhere named for Dr. Drew because it was named later that year. Also, there was a flurry of schools <laughs> built for um, other students. This is a picture of what was called Tri-Cities High School at first, and then it was renamed John Molly Moorhead High School in the 50s. And at the time, it was state of the art. It was considered very, very uh, wonderful facility. Um, and followed, we had uh, in the midst of all of this, we have Brown versus Board of Education, but nothing much changed in the county. What happened is the school boards followed the North Carolina policies, and Dr. Tucson may talk some more about the Pearsall plan or pupil assignment laws. Um, there were some folks from Reedsville NAACP who signed a petition for school desegregation and submitted it to the local school officials, but there was no action taken on any of that. And so, um, a couple of other things to mention. And um, over on the western side of the county, Madison and Madden are two small uh, textile towns. Um, and they merged their schools in 1959. Before that, Madden was part of the county system. And so uh, there was a new school built in Madison, Madden, which is now the Western Rockingham Middle School. Uh, also, in, I wanted to mention that Rockingham County had a very strong legacy of vocational training. In the Leakesville area, uh, there, there had been a long, a long time um, classes for the textile workers. There was a, a vocational education center established in 1958, and this was very, very up to date. And um, that was adjacent to Moorhead High School. And when the community college opened in 1966, this equipment and so forth and the teachers were transferred over to the community college. But we have a very strong history of industrial education and vocational education. Was the college integrated in 1966? That is something, it was never segregated. RCC was never segregated. So it opened as open to all in 1966. And I won't cover all of this because I'm hoping Dr. Tucson has time to do it, but uh, it really took a decade for the schools of Rockingham County to desegregate. And it starts with early requests in 1960 and 61 for student transfers. There was one request in 1960 by a student uh, whose family did not take any action when he was denied. In 61, there were six students from Reedsville who requested reassignment. They were all denied as well, but they filed complaints in federal district court and this made its way through the court system. 
Most of the county operated under freedom of choice, gradual desegregation. And what really put pressure on the schools to desegregate eventually were federal mandates from HEW. Um, they withheld federal money, federal funds until um, school systems could show that they were making a serious effort to desegregate. And then finally, some court decisions in the late 1960s. The last segregated school we had in the county was Moss Street Elementary, which was um, desegregated by court order in January 1970. So I'll end with that and thank you. Thank you. Have a couple of questions or um, maybe just a, a, a recap. So the plaintiffs of the Griggs versus Duke Power case, the first one, um, the oldest one, eldest one, uh, was James Tucker. Uh, he was born in 1911. And the youngest is uh, Willie Griggs, who was born in 1929. So they would have attended, if they, if they attended school, they would have attended those one room schoolhouses. Or they might have attended Booker T. Washington. It was open since 1922. Oh, so. well, of the ones, but that was a high school when it opened? It did, yes, it provided some high school level classes. Into but what grade level would it have started at? Um, it provided all the grades. Okay. The so they, they may have, if they lived in the reasonable area, mm -hmm they may have went to Booker T. Right. Okay. So of those uh, 14 men, I've, I've been able to document that three actually will graduate from high school. Um, the, and then, like I said before, eight of them are World War II veterans uh, with that. Um, also with my research, it looks like there's, they vary in different school levels. Um, I've got one documented with third grade and like I said, all the way to high school. And I've been able to document that at least one of the men um, was able to have one year of college um, with that. So it's really impressive that now I can put a picture of where they may have went to school mm -hmm. with the information that I have of, of where, where they landed uh, with that. So thank you. That was really interesting. Dr. Chusen is now going to give this a broader context. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, let me try sharing my screen here. Um, okay. Hopefully that is visible to everyone. Um, someone add something to the chat if it's not. <clears throat> um, but thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. Um, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to um, join this conversation. Um, thanks especially to Valencia Abbott and everyone at the Museum and Archives of Rockingham County. Uh, I had the pleasure, just as a side note, uh, the pleasure of getting to know Valencia Abbott uh, when she recently received an award from the Historical Society of North Carolina for her excellence in teaching. And I have been so impressed to learn through her um, you know, about some of the efforts going on in uh, um, Rockingham County. Um, hold on a second, I'm just make, trying to make sure that the chat is not obscuring the view here on the screen. Um, it popped up on my, my screen, get it out of the way there. Okay. Um, but I've been so impressed to learn um, all the things that Ms. Abbott has been doing to use students um, as histori historians documenting your, your local civil rights history. Um, that's historical teaching at its best, and I know I'll be learning from what you're finding. Um, and congratulations as well on the two upcoming historical markers. Um, first, I want to share just a little bit about how I came uh, to this topic and eventually wrote the book that I, I did on uh, um, this topic. 
Um, all of the images I'll be sharing with you this evening come from my book, Greater Than Equal, um, with the exception of the one here um, that we're looking at right now, which I came upon on the Digital NC site that has digitized so many school yearbooks. Um, this photograph is from 1954 um, at the dedication of a school bus uh, for Booker T. Washington High School. Um, and among the people pictured there, Mr. Joe Wright, Ida Duncan, and uh, Principal H.K. Griggs. Um, so I'm going to be sharing images and stories from my book, and I thought I'd just explain a little bit how that project evolved. I grew up in North Carolina, and for that reason, I've been drawn to stories of state and local history. I'm the daughter of educators and for that reason, I am interested in educational history. One of my parents is from the South, one from the Midwest, and I think that added to a curiosity about regional differences. In my early work as a graduate student at UNC further piqued my interest in the mid 20th century South. And I was particularly drawn to the educational politics of that period for a couple of reasons. One was historiographical. It seemed at that time, and that has been a while now, but at that time, we had a lot of literature about school desegregation, as well as the early um, phases of public schooling in the South, but less about this sort of in-between period, especially with regard to questions of race, a period that historian C. Van Woodward once um, said, that's when segregation reached its perfection. And by that, he did not mean, of course, perfection in ethical terms, but rather that segregation reached its fullest institutional expression. Also, historians often had told the story of school equalization, which is what I eventually became interested in, that is the struggle on the part of African Americans to try to equalize um, the um, conditions within segregated schools. A lot of historians had told that from the perspective of national organizers of the NAACP. And I wanted to understand more about how individual communities like Rockingham County had sought to equalize Jim Crow schools. So taking inspiration from oral history initiatives at UNC and Duke, I followed a new wave of interest in capturing the experiences of segregation's last generation. And let that be a word of inspiration to those students collecting oral histories. You never know, you know what future historians might be inspired by the stories you're collecting. <clears throat> Finally, my choice of topic also reflects my generational vantage point. My mother, so one generation back, grew up in a South that was completely segregated. Whereas when I was growing up in North Carolina, levels of school integration were reaching their historic peak. And yet by the time I was in graduate school, there was growing evidence of school resegregation. As I write in my book, having once viewed my generation as the first of presumably many to attend in integrated schools, I began to wonder if we were instead an aberrant blip on the radar of educational history. The litigation surrounding school resegregation in the late 20th and early 21st centuries was at the was raising some. Uh, once were familiar questions, how can educational equality be measured? How is racial diversity connected to equality? Can racially separate schools ever be truly equal? And can they prepare children for full citizenship? At a moment when policymakers across the country seem to be reintroducing those questions, I wanted to take a closer look at the generation of men and women who understood firsthand what it meant to struggle for school equality and first class citizenship within a segregated society. So my book looks at how Black North Carolinians press for equalization at several levels, school curricula, higher education, teacher salaries, school facilities, how white officials co-opted that strategy as a means for delaying integration, and I'll explain that further in a moment. And finally, how black activism for equalization evolved into a fight for something greater than equal. Integrated schools that served as models of both material equality and civic inclusion. 
I argue that this struggle should not be viewed as a mere detour on the road to Brown v. Board of Education, but rather as a movement that mobilized Black communities, narrowed material disparities between Black and white schools, fostered Black school pride, and profoundly shaped the eventual struggle for desegregation. I also argue that um, the remarkable achievements of equalization activism should not obscure the inherent limitations of any fight for equality in a deeply segregated society. In fact, the stories I've told ultimately point to the inextricable connections linking educational equality, racial inclusiveness, and the achievement of first-class citizenship. So I wanna mention five themes from the broad story, and my book looks at the, the big statewide story um, that I tell in my book, but show how they intersect in various ways with the story of Rockingham County schools, um, as well as the context for the Griggs case. And I really appreciate all the information Dr. Russell presented, which uh, I learned a lot um, from that. So I'll try to um, show how some of that fits into the, the broad statewide context. So first of my five themes, um, and some of this touches on what Dr. Russell already mentioned, uh, Rockingham County, like other areas in the state and region, saw an expansion of Black educational opportunities in the 1920s, but that expansion fell far short of educational equalization. It should be first noted that prior to the 1920s, some of the most passionate advocates for universal public schooling in the South were Black freed people during Reconstruction in the late 19th century. And there's a direct correlation between the violent disfranchisement of those Black educational advocates in the 1890s and dwindling public funds for Black schools. In the first two decades of the 20th century, right after North Carolina's disfranchisement laws were passed, the share of public school funds going to Black schools was actually decreasing. So in the, the two decades, you know, leading up to the 1920s, Black share of public school funds was actually decreasing. Um, <clears throat> to give you one statistic, in 1900, African Americans constituted about one third of the state's population and received just over 28% of state school funds. By 1915, their share had dropped to just 13%. So what were the consequences of this decline in funds? A state report from around this time, 1921, offered a sobering picture of the state of public education in North Carolina. Both black and whites, um, according to this report, had schoolhouses that were of, quote, mainly poor condition, yet conditions were most bleak for rural black North Carolinians. While the average white rural schoolhouse was valued at around $1,300, the same for rural African-Americans was valued at around $350. Often these schools were one room, one teacher facilities with weather-beaten exteriors, pot-bellied stoves for heating, homemade benches for, um, for pot-bellied stoves for heating, homemade benches for seating, inadequate provisions for drinking water and outhouses that pose a threat to sanitation. The devastating decline in black public funding, um, uh, black public school funding rather, slowly began to reverse itself right around 1919. And that's when I opened my, my book. That's the moment in the years right after World War I when African-Americans used their wartime service, many African-American soldiers you know, from North Carolina fought um, during uh, that war, they used their wartime service as a um, bargaining chip for school improvements. White state and local officials who were hoping to contain agitation and discourage black workers from moving north for jobs began to invest a little bit more money into black schools. And it was in this period, for example, that the first black public high schools opened. Um, Reedsville's Booker T. Washington High, which opened in 1922, reflects that trend. And as many of you probably know, in 1923, Booker T. Washington High School was one of only four 
black high schools in North Carolina to receive state accreditation. The other three were located in Durham, Wilmington, and Method, a community in Raleigh. Um, the photograph you're looking at here is of um, the newly built Washington High School in, in Raleigh, a historically black high school. Um, and this photograph was part of a little exhibit the state put together to brag about all that it was doing for black education. Now, the state did contribute to this building uh, boom, but much of the money for new black schools came from private sources, both from African Americans themselves and outside philanthropies like the Rosenwald Fund, which Dr. Russell already mentioned. Um, just a little bit more background on that. Um, the fund was named for Julius Rosenwald, a Chicago businessman of German Jewish heritage and president of Sears Roebuck and Company. I'll show you an image of a Rosenwald school from Harnett County. This picture comes from 1923. I like it because it juxtaposes the, the old school it replaced and the new one. Um, you can see the, the stark contrast. Um, as Dr. Russell mentioned, uh, the, the funds for Rosenwald schools came from three places. Half of the funds were private, and within that half, about you know half of that was from the Rosenwald Fund. Um, but those funds were contingent on Black communities raising matching funds. So you know the PTA getting together and having fundraisers. Um, the other half came from um, uh, public funds, mostly local public funds. Um, <clears throat> Now, since African Americans already paid taxes earmarked for public education, the burden of raising matching funds amounted to what historian James Anderson has termed double taxation. In other words, the Rosenwald Fund provided welcome assistance in some dramatic you know, changes in school conditions, even as it entailed a heavy dose of black self-help. Rockingham County was eventually home to 10 Rosenwald schools, and North Carolina in total had 813 Rosenwald schools, more than any other Southern state. Despite the dramatic Black school building boom of the 1920s, a simultaneous and much larger boom in white school construction ensured enduring educational inequalities. One state official estimated that North Carolina spent 10 times as much on white school buildings as it did on black schools during the 1920s. Indeed, in 1919, white per pupil school property values were four times greater than the same for black students. In 1929 and, um, to 30, the differential was not much different with white values being 3.7 times greater. Moreover, there were still stark di differentials in Black access to the high school grades, which would, of course, would become a key question in the Griggs case. Looking at the state as a whole, in 1930, African Americans had access to only 10% of the state's public high schools, despite constituting about a third of the high school age population. Okay, a second theme I want to emphasize um, is uh, kind of what happened within the school buildings. School of quality, of course, can't be measured in terms of facilities alone. And so uh, I talk a lot in the book um, about what happened inside the schools uh, in terms of curricula or what we now might say, you know, in terms of outcomes. The Black Teachers Association had long called for the same curricular guidelines to be given to both Black and white schools. They rejected what at the time was a popular white notion that black schools should always receive a more industrial or vocational oriented course of study. Under pressure from black educators and parents, the state agreed in 1924 to offer black schools the same course of study found at white schools. Nonetheless, while symbolically significant, this nominal curricular equalization was a hollow victory in certain ways. Black schools, especially at the high school level, often did not have the resources for implementing the same curriculum as white schools. 
And you can add a chemistry course, but if you have limited funding to have a chemistry lab, you know, that limits the, the power of that course. Also, Black high school students disproportionately felt pressure to drop out of school and contribute to the family income. Um, and to kind of reinforce that point, which again, I think is significant with regard to understanding the Griggs case, all male plaintiffs in that case, um, you may have been noticing looking at this picture, this is um, the 1926 uh, graduating class at Hillside High in Durham. And um, you can see it's overwhelmingly female. Just as a side note, the young woman on the far right in the front row is um, the famous civil rights activist, Polly Murray. She was in that class. Um, uh, very few men. Um, and that was found statewide. Males felt more pressure to drop out of school earlier and contribute to the um, family income, particularly uh, if they're from farming families. And I um, wanted to bring in a Rockingham connection if I could. I looked at the earliest yearbook from B Booker T. Washington High School that I could find, which was from 1948. And I looked at the senior class and it appeared to have 34 females and 13 males. So, you know, kind of a reflection of this larger pattern. Another limitation of curricular equalization was that while it granted Black access to white author curricula, most state officials um, at the Department of Public Education were white, the exception of some within the Division of Negro Education. Um, so white author curricula, Black teachers had to draw upon their own resources to add subjects of particular interest to Black students. And I'm thinking especially about Black history. Um, have a, a section on that in, in the, the book, the early Black history movement. Finally, curricular equalization offered access to a liberal arts course of study, um, but eventually more sophisticated vocational programs came into vogue in white schools, and those often were not um, funded at African American schools. As the Black educator Horace Mann Bond wrote in the mid-1930s, the Negro high school may have Latin, Greek, or any other subject which it wishes that calls for no equipment or no expensive construction, but the large appropriations for the installation of machinery go to the white schools. Um, this is an image from uh, Future Farmers of America gathering in Pitt County in 1958. Um, and so, you know, in the, the 50, 40s, 50s, um, part of the equalization movement involved uh, uh, calls for more um, sophisticated vocational training that could um, prepare students for careers. Without question, the most valuable resources that most Black schools had were the teachers themselves. And I want to mention their struggle for salary equality, um, because since it's a story of labor activism, this offers a third point of resonance with the Griggs story. In the early 1930s, national leaders within the NAACP were hoping to organize a lawsuit to equalize teacher salaries in the South. And they um, first thought of North Carolina, which had a reputation for being somewhat more progressive than some of the other Southern states. We could talk at length about that reputation it had and what was sort of true about it and definitely not. Um, prominent NAACP leaders such as poet Langston Hughes and others came to North Carolina in 1933 for a rally in Raleigh attended by a couple thousand Black teachers and other citizens. But the elder leaders within the Black Teachers Association feared that the participation of the NAACP would compromise the fragile ties they had established with white officials. You know, they were afraid if they signed on with this lawsuit um, that the, the very fragile ties they'd made with certain white state officials would, would be broken. As the president of the Black Teachers Association, Oliver Pope, put it at the time, he said, we cannot afford to disestablish the direct channel of contact which we have at all times with those in authority in North Carolina if this channel is diverted from the North Carolina Negro to the New York Negro, the NAACP was headquartered in New York, 
and then back to North Carolina, the wayside station in New York might not last as long as our problems. So he's saying, who's our more certain ally here? In fact, the National Office of the NAACP was never successful in convincing the leaders of the Black Teachers Association to sue the state. Now it's you know, easy uh, all these years later to be critical of the association for not um, uh, joining forces with the National Office of the NAACP and launching this lawsuit. Um, but of course the risks were enormous in doing that. Um, while organizing litigation to challenge the white power structure carried considerable risk, even at the time of the Griggs case, it was even more fraught with unknowns in the 1930s. It was not until 1944 when state officials felt pressure from lawsuits in surrounding states, including Virginia, that North Carolina equalized its teacher salaries. And I'll show you a chart here that points out something interesting about this story. Um, I know the type is kind of tiny. I don't know if you can really see this very well, but the kind of on the bar graph, the periwinkle color, um, kind of the lavender or periwinkle um, represents black teacher salaries and the magenta is white teacher salaries. And this covers the years 1919, 1960. And you can see that up until the mid 40s, white teachers are getting considerably more money. Well, first of all, you can also notice that teacher salaries are quite low, even adjusting for the, the salaries of the time. Um, some things never change. Um, but uh, the biggest gap is around the late 20s, early 30s, when white teacher salaries were almost double what black teachers were getting. And then by the time salary equalization happens in the mid 40s, on average, black teachers were receiving a little bit more than white teachers. And the reason for that is once the state only used what it was supposed to be using years of experience and educational training as benchmarks for what salary level teachers should be getting, African-American teachers on average had more of those things than white teachers did. Um, they had more years of experience, they were more likely to have graduate degrees. You know, at a time of limited professional training for African-Americans for other types of careers, many you know, uh, got well-trained for teaching and stayed in it. Um, and so uh, um, the salary levels reflect that. My fourth connection entails a bolder phase in educational activism um, that came right after World War II. And just as with the Griggs case, it first emerged from um, what some might have thought would have been an unexpected place, an unexpected group of people. In other words, not from the educated uh, you know, middle class elites in the more urban areas of the Piedmont, but rather in this case, from working class young people in rural Eastern North Carolina. And so I love these stories that kind of um, complicate our understanding of, you know, really where the civil rights movement started in North Carolina. Yes, Greensboro was a big story in Charlotte, but, you know, in these other communities too, you know, Rockingham County. Um, in this case, this story comes from Robinson County and Lumberton in particular. I devote uh, one chapter of my book um, in large part to this story from 1946 when um, the young people of Lumberton, uh, African-American young people organized a school boycott to protest conditions at two local black schools. Many of these young people had joined an NAACP youth council. One of the schools is pictured here. You can see the windows are broken. The exterior is in disrepair. Inside the building, you can see um, it was poorly lit with single light bulbs. Um, they had limited uh, options for drinking water, as pictured on the right, and um, relied on outhouses. And I know, you know, from what Dr. Russell is saying, those conditions were still to be found. Um, in the 40s in Rockingham County as well. Um, <clears throat> so in October 1946, students uh, organized uh, protests through the streets of Lumberton to, to protest these conditions. 
That was followed by a boycott of about 10 days and ended when local officials agreed to build two new schools. The significance, uh, and I should mention this um, headline here is from the Pittsburgh Courier, an African-American newspaper that got national circulation. Um, and here's an image from that same story. The only image I could find actually of the students themselves on the day of the, the initial protest. The significance of these young civil rights activists was not lost on Thurgood Marshall, then director of the NAACP's Legal Defense and Educational Fund, who later called the protests, quote, one of the finest things ever pulled in the NAACP. Indeed, the walkout and strike garnered local, state, and even national coverage. Um, like I said, it made the front page of the Pittsburgh Courier. The Raleigh News and Observer also carried extensive coverage of the case, including an indicting front page photographic expose of black school conditions in Lumberton. At first, the News and Observer expressed disapproval of the students' actions, arguing that strikes are never justified until other remedies have been exhausted. But by the fourth day of the strike, the paper backtracked. Quote, ordinarily student strikers are not to be condoned, an editorial stated, but in this case, the difficulty is not in understanding why the students struck. What is hard to understand is why they ever started to school in such buildings and why they were ever permitted to do so. According to this editorial, Lumberton's Black schools marked a, a disgrace to the state. Local reaction was mixed. One of the protests organizers, Gus Bullock, had shots fired into his home one evening. While nobody was injured, the message of white hostility to black protests was clear. The white newspaper condemned the strike as, quote, an unfortunate and ill-advised uh, effort and a source of undesirable publicity. Race relations in Robinson County, the paper editorialized, are and have been harmonious and they will remain so despite outside sinister and pernicious influences which enter peaceful communities only to stir up discord and strife. This local white his hostility to the protest was not unexpected, but the messages of disapproval did not stop there. Protest organizer Lillian Mc McQueen recalled in an interview with me that some of their most outspoken critics were found among Black community leaders. McQueen reflected when I interviewed her, she said, there were a lot of people, Black people, that said we shouldn't have done that but what are you going to do? Letters to the editor in the local newspaper backed up her memories. The Redstone, Redstone was the name of one of the schools, um, PTA sent a letter arguing that, quote, efforts to solve our problems through peaceful protests were preferred over a resort to radicalism. The principal of another one of the schools urged parents to send their kids to school and not participate in the boycott. Some of the children, he said, are striking for the novelty of it and don't understand what they're doing. We do have a bad school situation out here, but radicals are not in a position to remedy this. Indeed, Black support for the protest tended to fall along generational lines, as well as class and geographic ones. Residents of East Pines, a neighborhood where many teachers and other Black professionals lived, withheld their support while residents of South Lumberton, where most working class African-Americans live, were more likely to lend their support. Residents of South Lumberton were vulnerable to white violence and intimidation too, but their employment status did not depend on the whims of a white school board. When local officials dragged their feet in making good on promises to build two new um, schools in Lumberton, a lawsuit emerged in 1947 from South Lumberton households where the breadwinners included a barber, truck driver, farmer, and domestic worker. So again, this working class insurgency. Their attorney, Herman Taylor, anticipated, quote, no mild outbursts since the good white folks in North Carolina have heretofore so effectively thwarted suits of this nature. White North Carolinians, Taylor predicted, would be surprised to learn that Black North Carolinians were ready to be led out of slavery. 
So did his predictions come true and what were the legacies of this protest and, and suit? Um, we certainly do, after 1946, see more Black communities in the state following in Lumberton's footsteps and indicating their readiness to be led out of slavery, as Taylor put it. In the early 1950s, there were a growing number of school equalization lawsuits. By 1951, one of those suits from Pamlico County, again, a you know, more rural county, had asked for integration as a remedy in the event of incomplete equalization. Also in 1951, the uh, state saw another student walkout, this time in Kinston, where 700 students walked out in demand of better conditions at the local Black high school. Did all these protests jolt white officials into action? To a certain extent, yes. Um, one state official told a gathering of school superintendents in 1947, shall we now dilly dally, neglect what we ought and can do, thus forcing Negroes in and outside North Carolina to go into the courts to equalize? The superintendent from Pender County spoke for many at the gathering when he remarked, our board does not crave any such publicity as Lumberton has received. It is true that from 1940 to 1952, per pupil spending levels increased at a faster pace for black students than for white students. Now there was a huge differential to make up. So, but briefly that the pace of increase was somewhat um, higher for African-American schools. And you do see a big decline, but not erasure in facilities differentials during this period. You can see in this chart that, um, in the late 40s and early 50s, a differential in, this is measuring per pupil, so per student, school property values. And I note that property values include the value of school sites, buildings, furniture, equipment, and library books. Um, there's a big dip that, that uh, or narrowing of the differential that happens in the early 50s. And that you know, it was reflective of those stories. Dr. Russell was talking about all the upgrades you, you begin to see in new school construction in the late 40s, early 50s. But there's still a differential that continues to exist um, throughout the, the mid 60s. The legacies of the Lumberton struggle were thus mixed. The protests and lawsuit had not erased inequality, although Black protests had led to substantial facility upgrades. Such improvements arguably delayed integration as they made Black school conditions more tolerable for African Americans and more defensible for whites. That said, you could argue that equalization activism indirectly facilitated the collapse of Jim Crow as it galvanized a spirit of protest that prefigured the movement of the 1950s and 1960s. Finally, that integration movement takes center stage in the last chapter of my book, and many of its themes also parallel, parallel rather, the story of Rockingham County Schools. Enduring inequalities with regard to buildings, books, School buses, this is another great school bus image from 1950 in, in Pitt County. In, in these rural areas, you know, um, having suffic sufficient school buses really was a critical issue for educational access. So, you know, all these enduring inequalities um, played a pivotal role in building a movement for school integration. And yet the state's earliest integration cases came not just from some of the state's most under-resourced black schools, but also from some of the state's most modern and recently constructed ones. Those cases underscore the point that, it, that is still often lost in popular memory of this story, that the struggle to integrate was not only about escaping second-class facilities, but also about escaping second-class citizenship. Just to give you one example of what I'm talking about, I'm sure some of you have seen this photograph before. It's kind of an iconic image of school desegregation in Charlotte in 1957. The um, young woman in the center there was, um, is Dorothy Counts, 
who was one of the first 11 black students to enter previously white schools that year. One small, but I would argue important detail of her story is that in 1957, she was slated to attend Charlotte's newest black high school, West Charlotte High, which had opened a $1 million building in the fall of 1954. She told me when I interviewed her, you know, for us in this community, it was considered state of the art. Nonetheless, Counts and her parents consented when the NAACP asked them to volunteer to attend All White Harding High. Um, she withdrew from Harding uh, rather quickly, as you can see from this photograph. She endured horrible harassment um, and so eventually withdrew, um, but, you know, attempted to, to integrate the school. In part, their decision um, to, you know, uh, volunteer her to integrate uh, West uh, Harding High um, was driven by their concern that inside the gleaming new West Charlotte High, the, the African American school, would still be hidden vestiges of inequality, such as older textbooks or fewer course options. But she quickly added, even if her family could have been assured that West Charlotte High was equal in all measurable respects, they still would have volunteered out of their conviction that, quote, segregation of the races was morally wrong. No amount of black school upgrades, Counts insisted, could have purchased her loyalty to segregation. Dorothy Counts' story aside, white efforts to modernize in, in quotes, and thereby preserve Jim Crow did without question complicate and slow the road to integration. In fact, the belated construction of new black schools like West Charlotte, like some of the ones mentioned about Rockingham County, suggests that the story of school equalization in the South is really two stories. One about the long civil rights movement and one about the long backlash to that movement, to borrow phrases from historian Jacqueline Hall's now familiar framing of that story. The long backlash against school integration at the primary and secondary level began at least in the late 1940s when the state began in one sense to co-opt the strategy of school equalization um, in hopes of delaying integration. That belated rehabilitation of Jim Crow's physical foundations still left many measurable inequalities in place, and it meant that the civil rights movement of the 1960s was left to unravel a social order that in certain respects was more deeply institutionalized than ever before. It also engendered ambivalence in Black communities, which had long sought school upgrades. A worker for the NAACP, for example, surveyed teachers across the state in, in, in 1955 and found a broad range of opinion about the merits of integration. Um, and I uh, look back at that and this uh, worker for the NAACP did talk to teachers in Reedsville. And according to that report, black teachers were quote, sharply divided on the question of integration. I emphasize in the book that Brown, Brown v. Board came not at a moment of declension or decline for black schools in North Carolina, but what, what at, at what for many was their institutional apogee. It came at a moment of you know, increasing resources, a moment when they were finally beginning to receive a more sub -sub substantive, if not equal, share of resources. Thus, it was common to find local Black communities in the 50s and even into the 60s working simultaneously to equalize and improve historically Black schools and to support the fight for integration. They were somewhat less inclined than the National Office of NAACP to see those two fights as mutually exclusive. I found this late phase of Black school facilities equalization um, remain, remain somewhat elusive in popular memory, in part because white officials at the time of desegregation closed or repurposed hundreds of Black schools that had been built or upgraded only years earlier. This happened in my hometown of Hickory. Indeed, all of the historically Black high schools in Rockingham County eventually ceased to exist as high schools, 
Across the state, most Black high schools became junior highs or administrative buildings or community centers, transformations that often had less to do with the viability of the bricks and mortar and more to do with questions of power and ownership of public space. Polled by the state in 1954, the state school superintendents unanimously agreed that whites would not want to attend school in buildings formerly used by African Americans. Quote, even Pharaoh's army, wrote one superintendent, could not make whites enter a school building which had been used by Negroes. Another wrote, 95% of our parents would feel that it would be an unforgivable disgrace. Most hard hit were black high schools because as the late Julius Chambers, the famous civil rights lawyer from North Carolina, who incidentally was one of the lead attorneys in the Griggs case, once explained whites might be willing to attend a former black school, but not to graduate from one. And in those new integrated schools, black students and teachers had to struggle for meaningful inclusion and recognition. Many Black educators lost jobs or were demoted at the time of integration, and Black students fought for recognition within the classroom and extracurricular activities. I noticed, for example, that in 1971, 60 Black students at Reedsville Senior High in the very early days of integration boycotted the school over discrimination in the selection of cheerleaders. I don't know if that story has come up in any of the oral histories, but that'd be an interesting one to dig into um, some more. In conclusion, I'll show you one more image. This I chose for the cover image of my book because I love this photograph. It comes from a, I don't have an exact date on it, probably the 50s or 60s um, from Rocky Mount, um, Annie Holland School there. And I loved it because you can see on the bulletin board in there in the back, um, they're studying the constitution and the development of democracy. And so it is literally pointing out the connections between education and democracy. Um, and in my book, I'm talking about both the direct connections as well as indirect ones too. At a time when the trends seem to be towards disinvestment in public education at all levels, and I'm talking about right now in the 21st century, the history I told in my book offers a counter narrative that stresses public schooling as both an essential privilege of and strategy for the achievement of first-class citizenship. It perhaps makes sense that to understand public education's ultimate value, it's worth listening to the voices of people who historically were denied its privileges. The state superintendent of schools in North Carolina noted in a report in the mid-1920s, quote, the Negro people seem to be pathetically desirous of sending their children to school. What that statement really missed, that pathetic desire, as he put it, of course, was rooted in the nature of race and citizenship in the South. As I explain in the book, with the rise of disfranchisement, Black citizenship no longer included a solid base of civil and political rights on which the more derivative privileges of social citizenship, such as education, rested. The beginning of the early 20th century after disfranchisement, Jim Crow turned that model on its head. For African Americans in the segregated South, the institutions of so social citizenship often had to function as a substitute for rather than as an extension of the more fundamental civil and political rights. Black North Carolinians looked, therefore, to public ed education as their way back to the civic foundations of American life. And as the Griggs case powerfully illustrated, the struggle for educational equality would continue for years to come to be inextricably intertwined with a much broader struggle for full inclusion in American life. Okay, I will stop there and happy as time permits to take any questions or, or comments. Stop sharing my screen. Um, first, thank you. Thank you for um, adding a, another layer to our understanding of not only the Griggs case, but the history of America, of the United States with that. 
Um, I don't think it's a part of history that many people dig into looking at education and getting those uh, historical truths to the understanding of who we are. So thank you um, for that. And any words from no, I guess, um, CJ, could you guide us through the questions? Right. While well, CJ, CJ, I'm going to let you uh, get that ready. I have, um, actually, it's a comment uh, for Sarah. Um, you mentioned the um, Leesville High School in the early, uh, at, near the end of uh, desegregation uh, with Leesville High School. Um, one of the plaintiffs' name is James Tucker, and his niece, um, Rochelle Tucker, who's a um, um, civil rights activist and leader here in uh, Reedsville, North Carolina. She was at Chapel Hill, and she ends up writing a paper about that incident. Oh, really? And, yes, and I read it, and it just gave, gave a really detailed, because, I mean, she was there to experience that. So I know that she donated um, it to the Reasonable Library. So if anybody's interested in reading it further, um, they should be able to find it at the Reasonable Library. But yeah, she gave insight. So I actually know about that when you mentioned that. I oh, I'd love stuff. to read that. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. And there's so many stories like that across the state. Um, these, you know, um, protests that are organized in the early 70s um, for inclusion in um, you know, all sorts of facets of newly integrated schools. Yeah, if I can get a copy, I will get it to you as soon as I can. That'd be great. All right, CJ? Can you hear me better? A little mm -hmm. bit better, so, yes. Okay. There's something wrong with the microphone on my computer, I think, um, but we'll go ahead. Um, so the first question I have is, from Ann Brady. Uh, she wants to know, is the principal Greg related to the Supreme Court Greg? I'm not sure about that re relationship. I, I really would have to do some research to find out if the principal Greg was related to the Supreme Court Greg. Um, but I did write that down when I saw it pop up. So it's on my to-do to research list. And I will as soon as we find that answer, we will share it out. Yes, uh, this is more of a comment for uh, Dr. Russell from Dr. L. Dennis White. When Booker T. Washington High School was built in 1951 on Moss Street, the older building was renamed North Scale Street Elementary School in 1951-1952. I attended from my first grade year in 1958 to 1965 when it was closed and we were all merged with Branch Street Elementary School into the newly built Moss Street Elementary School. I attended Moss Street for my 7th and 8th grade years before moving to the high school 9th grade in 1966. I mentioned this because I did not see North Scale Street mentioned in, uh, by Dr. Ross. Um, uh, CJ, I just saw a comment popped up. They still can't hear you. And they wanted us to repeat the question, but that was very detailed. Um, so I would, can the attendees see the chat or the questions that are listed or only you? Uh, everybody should see it, give me one second. Okay. Maybe we can do it that way so that everybody can have access um, to that. So while we're waiting on uh, CJ, um, one of the questions, well, one of my questions is you mentioned about Lumberton, uh, 1946 boycott. I had never heard of that. Um, and the way that you described it, it seemed to be really significant in pushing uh, integration. Is this one of the things that gets us to Brown versus the Board of Education? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the, uh, the interesting little piece of that story, Thurgood Marshall really wanted the Lumberton case to turn into an integration case. Um, and uh, the local community was divided on that. 
Um, and eventually the lawsuit kind of fizzled out when the two new schools were built. Um, and so Marshall got frustrated with Lumberton and started looking elsewhere for test cases. But I mean, these early equalization cases absolutely paved the way, um, you know, for, for Brown v. Board. Um, the, the leap that had to be made with Brown v. Board was pointing out that school segregation was unconstitutional, even if all facilities were equal. Um, in the case of Lumberton, it could easily be shown they were not e anywhere close to being equal. Um, but, uh, you know, the NAACP hoped to um, uh, use such cases to kind of pave the way um, towards Brown. Okay. And I think it's really important or to showcase how important local history is to telling a fuller picture of our country's history. So, um, yes, um, very interesting. I, I got notes everywhere, but I definitely wanted to touch on that one. Okay, so sorry about the technical difficulties with my computer. Um, so the one you could barely hear was about uh, Booker T. Washington uh, <coughs> becoming North Scale Street Elementary School in 1951 and 1952. Dr. White attended from first grade year 1958 through 1965 when it was closed and they were all merged with Branch Street Elementary School into the newly built Moss Street Elementary School. They attended Moss Street for their seventh and eighth grade years before moving to the high school ninth grade in 1966. And they mentioned this because they did not see North Scale Street mentioned by Dr. Russell during her presentation. So that was more of just a clarifying point. Um, and then we have a couple comments. Uh, Amy King, I just wanted to say I've admired Valencia Abbott for some time, but this is amazing. So proud of you, uh, you students for your hard work and the incredible skills you have developed with oral history. I know you are so thankful, Ms. Abbott. I am in awe of all you do. This project is so incredible. I'm learning so much to share with my students in Chatham County, North Carolina, with a smiley face. Um, Yvonne Haynes echoed that comment saying, yes, Valencia is awesome. I think we can all agree with that <laughs> statement. Um, Ann Brady, uh, uh, in commenting on Dr. Russell's presentation, very interesting history of Rockingham County Schools. Um, and then David Camp provided um, a comment that's kind of a good, thoughtful comment about um, where we can move forward with this project. Uh, we might think about trying to track down descendants of white and black folks who worked together in setting up public schools and incorporated them into in a public acknowledgement of very old school cross racial collaboration, great allyship and activism that can inspire us today. Um. I, before I ask any more questions, do either one of you have any questions or follow up? No, I'm just, I, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by how much I learned tonight from all of you. <laughs> so um, thank you all for this uh, wonderful elucidating presentation that's happened. Um, yes, um, I am halfway done with your book. And one of the reasons that it's slow going is that I am highlighting so much because I was like, this is important, this is important. And a lot of it is just new history to me that I didn't know, but I want to, uh, I guess, bring it or end it because um, the focus is on Griggs. And you mentioned the Brown versus the, um, Brown versus the Board of Education. And I am using this book. Um, there's only two books that I know of that's written about the Griggs case. Um, and this is in the introduction. And this was early on in my research with Griggs when it was compared to the Brown versus the Board of Education uh, case. And basically it says that the Griggs case did what Brown versus the Board of Education does with the education, um, that it expanded that. So, we know about Brown versus the Board of Education, but hardly anybody even knows about this case. But this is a really significant moment in the civil rights movement. And the fact that the, the 
residue from that case still resonates with us today. That is still in place in human resources. Office is this Griggs case and what they can do, it makes it even more powerful. So we need to understand the role of education, not only in the past, but how it's also affecting the future. So I just want to put that out there and your, your research, your study, your book, your presentation adds to our understanding. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll echo the gratitude. I, I really do look forward to reading what oral histories all are collecting um, because I, I know I will learn new things from those. So it's uh, the learning is a two way street. Um, and I, I'm grateful for all you're doing to, to really capture those rich local stories that otherwise might not get captured. And I want to applaud my students um, the ones that's been doing the research for the last six months, the ones that are still in this meeting, uh, recording, uh, learning, because they truly are saving a part of our story that could not possibly have been done uh, without them. Um, they are truly an asset and I am truly blessed to be their teacher. And I sincerely mean that. Okay. All right. Um... If anybody has any questions, comments, now is your chance to get them in there. Um, again, thank you all for attending tonight. Um, this will, once the recording gets put together, I will get it put on the March YouTube page so that you can review it. Um, I know I will have to review it to sort of absorb all this information that was shared tonight. Thank you, Dr. Susan, for participating with us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Russell, for your wonderful history of Rockingham County. Thank you, Valencia, for taking the lead on this project. And um, I look forward to seeing you all at the historic marker unveilings. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Y'all have a good night.